background. In 1990, he received his bachelor's degree from Oxford in philosophy, politics, and economics. And then later, he got his master's degree from Harvard in regional studies, focusing on Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. And most recently, he got his PhD from Columbia in 2004. Um, his work experience, he's worked for, as a senior economic assistant for the Scottish office industry in the UK Government Economic Service, as an administrator for the Commission of the European Union, and also as a consultant for the World Bank. And he has been working at UNC since 2004, and uh, in the fall of 2005, he was a visiting professor for University of Mexico. Dr. Robinson's, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Robinson's work focuses on some of the uh, more dynamic aspects of political science, specifically governance in hybrid and authoritarian regimes, as well as labor protest politics in emerging democracies and the former Soviet Union. These fields are important today for uh, several reasons. One um, is the recent protests in the uh, Arab world. While not necessarily labor protests, Dr. Robinson's work still helps us uh, shed light on the ongoing violence and political mobilization. In fact, some of his work is on the democratic gap in Arab-majority countries and helps us understand why the Arab nations specifically are experiencing this upheaval rather than Muslim nations in general. Another is the upcoming Russian elections. Uh, much of his work focuses on Russian politics and political labor mobilization in post-communist Russia. Although we're pretty sure he's going to win the elections, uh, Dr. <laughs> Robertson's work can give us insight into the process and structure behind British power and what role, if any, workers and the interests of the oligarchs that they represent will play. Today, Dr. Robinson will be speaking about his recently submitted paper, Modes of Liberalization, written together with research partner Grigori Pop Elakesh. Thank you. The paper focuses on the role of elections as causal factors to liberalization within alter alter excuse me, authoritarian regimes. Dr. Robinson and Pop Elakesh. <laughs> Distinguish between different types of electoral liberalizations and identify the variables and processes that lead to their development. They also explore the power dynamics between the incumbent and opposition and they lead authoritarian, authoritarian regimes to call for elections. The handouts making your way around the room or making their way around the room are a diagram of what Dr. Robertson calls a dictator's decision tree. Uh, it provides a visual representation of the electoral and democratic flows that sometimes result in liberalization and sometimes deliberalization. The diagram really helped me conceptualize the framework of the argument and my hope is that it will do the same for you. And without any further ado, please help us welcome Dr. Graham Edwards. Thank you, Richard. Very kind introduction. I'm, I've been thinking about firing Popel Cash for a while, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think this, this his days are now numbered. Um, if only he wasn't smarter than me, you know. That would make you do. Uh, so this, thanks for the, the kind introduction, and uh, this is a project uh, I want to sort of talk a, a little bit about one part of it today um, that I'm working on. It's really a book project um, that we've been working on for uh, a couple of years now, uh, which looks at p the political regime dynamics in the post-Cold War era. And, and, and it's basically premised upon uh, an overall uh, notion that the post-Cold War era is different from the Cold War era. Um, and in particular, the kinds of things that authoritarians are able to do in the post-Cold War era is different from what, from what they were before. And specifically, what, what we're thinking behind this is that essentially, um, wherever country you're in charge of, wherever, wherever it is in the world, you have to have a story about why you are in charge. You have to have some legitimizing myth, some legitimizing story. Now, in the Cold War era, there was, there was, there was about at least four different ways that you could legitimize uh, governance. Um, and what we're arguing is that in the post-Cold War era, there's now only really two, um, or two and a half. And this is, just changes the, the nature of rule. In the Cold War era, you could um, be a democracy, and you could say, well, I'm in charge, I'm the government of this country because I got elected by the people and through this process, constitutions, etc. cetera. Um, or you could say, uh, I'm in charge of this country because God appointed me, right? uh, in, in, a, in a theocracy. Um, or you could say, you know, I'm in charge of this country because the laws of history appointed me, right? Marx appointed me. Marx's understanding of the laws of history, my special knowledge of how history develops, um, gives us, as the Communist Party, a leading role in society. Right? This is the official story you would have seen in Stalin's constitution. Um, or you could say, you know, I'm here, I'm a military dictator, and I'm here to provide security and keep the communists out. Right? These were the basic, the four sort of main stories. 
um, that people told. With the death of communism as a kind of active, mobilizing, politically viable uh, ideology, um, that takes out communism and it really puts a big dent in the, if, it, if not me, it'll be the communists uh, kind of justification. And so you're left with traditional monarchies pointed by God um, or, uh, uh, or democracies. And you can still have you know, dictatorship on the grounds that if it's not as it's the Islamists, but that's, sort of a, that's, that's why it's two and a half rather than, that, rather than just two. And what we argue in this, in this project is this, this really changes the nature of, of, of politics. What it means is lots and lots of dictators are going to have to work harder to develop some form of electoral legitimacy. This is inherently tricky and it's going to generate some problems. So that's, that's the underlying sort of uh, idea for the book. And then we look at um, a whole series of different things when countries become more democratic, when they become less democratic, how if they become more democratic, does that actually work, which is this paper. Um, what's the role of international assistance, international aid projects uh, in this process? How does that, does that really work? We're doing a large end global study on that. Um, I'm also involved in uh, a study that's going to take place starting uh, the beginning of November, going through the end of the Russian elections, looking very specifically in different regions of Russia. Uh, trying to evaluate how the USAID projects have, what impact they've actually had on the ground in the, in the, in the different places. So it's a kind of multi-level um, thing. That should give you a sense of, of, of where, this, where this stuff sort of fits. Um, the paper today that we're uh, talking about, um, really gets, that I'm going to talk about, really comes up from a specific part of that puzzle, which is the fact that um, uh, we, we've seen in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, um, is a proliferation of um, moments in which dictators who had re-established themselves after the, after the, 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 the collapse of communism, um, which people were starting to call uh, the, the reverse wave from, the, from, the, from what was known as the third wave of, of political democratization. Right? So you get... The, the uh, first wave of, of democratization, for those of you who are not in my democracy seminar, um, happens in the 19th century. It's basically when, when the West European and, and countries and, uh, become democratic. You get a second wave uh, of democratization, uh, which is really in the aftermath of the, of the Second World War, um, uh, when you get democratization in Germany and, 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 and the Far East. And then you get what was known as the third wave, which begins uh, in... Uh, in, in really Spain, Portugal, and Greece, uh, and then spreads with the collapse of communism to, to all sorts of countries around the, the world. After that, we started to get to see what people call reversion or backsliding dictators, reestablishing themselves, especially in places in the former Soviet Union, but also other places. That was kind of the story between about 1991 and the late 1990s. Then all of a sudden, in the late 1990s, we get all these uh, events that people identified as electoral revolutions or colored revolutions that took place in, in the former Soviet Union. Um, there was some work by other people identifying what they called liberalizing elections, mostly in, in, in Africa. Um, this is the, the work of, of Howard and Rossler and Lindbergh. Um, and they all argued that, that what you're seeing is elections playing this really important role in uh, liberalized, political liberalization, political openings, uh, pushing back this rever the reversion of the, of, the, of, the, of the third wave. So what we decided to do was actually look around and see, um, are these people right? Is this really what's going on? Are there, A, lots of liberalizations taking place in the world in the post-Cold War era? And what are they like? What's, what's really, is, it, is it really this electoral dynamic that, that people are, are, are talking about? And is it really about incumbents getting overthrown by electoral revolutions um, or by, by liberalizing elections, elections in which, which incumbents lose? And what we find, in fact, is that there's a really... There are lots of liberalizations going on. We actually, um, using some rules that I'll talk about later, identified 92 different cases of significant political liberalization over a relatively short period of time um, that have taken place in the Cold War era, um, but that they're really varied, and lots of different things uh, happen. Um, you get electoral revolutions that, that, that academics have talked about a lot. You get electoral turnovers. But you also get liberalizations that are actually led by incumbent authoritarians who open up um, for, for, for reasons that we'll talk about. And you get non-electoral things like the, the recent Arab uh, Spring events in Tunisia and, and, and Egypt. Just to give you some examples of some of these things, 
the electoral revolution that, that, that was probably, I think, the most uh, striking one, a case of an authoritarian regime that holds an election, fakes the results, and then gets kicked out because of pro post-electoral protests in the streets. The emblematic case is Ukraine, 2004, the so-called Orange Revolution. Um, this also happened in Georgia uh, in 2003. It happened in, 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 in Serbia uh, in 2000. Um, uh, and uh, something similar or, or has happened in Kyrgyzstan at least twice. Um, but electoral revolutions don't always happen, right? So you have to bear this in, in mind. A lot of people went off and they studied the electoral revolutions without paying attention to the fact that they don't always happen. It didn't happen in, in Russia in 2008. Um, I was speaking to somebody in Moscow yesterday who convinced me that, uh, that it will happen this time and that we don't really know. We, we may know who's going to win the elections, but the fact that we know who's going to win the elections is going to cause a lot of trouble. Um, we'll see. I'm not sure that I buy that, but we'll see. Um, Sometimes when you get electoral revolutions, they actually fail, like in Iran. And what you get is instead of um, a liberalization resulting from the electoral revolution, you actually get a clampdown, a more authoritarian, a, 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 a nastier, if you like, uh, regime taking place. That's very much what happened in Iran in 2009. Um, other times you get electoral turnover without revolution. So in Slovakia in, two, in, in 1998, does anyone know who this guy is? This is, uh, this is Vladimir Mečiar, who was the, kind of the Slovak strongman in, in the, in the mid-1990s, a former boxer um, who, uh, who was really, uh, in the, the mid-to-1990s, really was looking like he was taking Slovakia in a, in a, in a mar markedly authoritarian uh, direction. They had elections in 1998, Mečiar lost, and to the surprise of a lot of people, he actually left office. Um, and it was only after that that, met, that, that Slovakia's so a path into the EU uh, became, um, became viable. Um, so you have these moments when <clears throat> you don't need to protest on the streets, you can actually just get electoral turnover. But you also get, and this is really the key, I think, insight of this paper, um, quite a number of cases in which incumbents themselves, incumbent authoritarians, liberalize um, and stay in power, right? But they allow for open elections, more political competition. This has been the case in Tanzania. It's often a gradual process. It takes place over a series of elections. It's been the case in Ghana um, uh, as well. Uh, and so we'll look into today at some of the conditions under which that kind of thing uh, is likely to happen. Um, then, of course, you get non-electoral kinds of, of revolutions. You get the events in Tunisia, uh, in Egypt, um, where uh, revolution succeeds at least in overthrowing incumbents. Um, whether they'll succeed in building something else is, 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 is up there uh, for grabs. So one of, one of the things I'm going to do is show you some data later on. Those are very emblematic events. I want to show you some data on uh, how widespread these kinds of things are, and what, 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 the, what, the, what the balance is. All right, so one of the things we're trying to do is understand when each of these things is likely to occur. And what we've tried to do in the theoretical part of the paper um, is come up with a, a, a model of how authoritarians and oppositions interact. Um, and the standard view that most people think about is essentially you have a nasty authoritarian dictator and a uh, cuddly democratic opposition. And the opposition wants democracy, and the dictator wants authoritarianism. And changes in the relative power between the two determine whether you get authoritarianism or you get uh, uh, democracy. I put it in kind of slightly silly terms, you know, nasty and cuddly, and, and um, to get you know, to get you to laugh a little bit, but also to to this is something that to make a point, and the point is that this is this is really the way. Governments, and especially the US government and, and, and often European governments, often think. They think that what you have is you have the incumbent dictator, you get rid of the incumbent dictator, the new guy is, going, is, is our guy, he's going to be nice. A really clear example of this is, is, is Saakashvili in, 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 in Georgia. Um, he went to Colombia, he must be a Democrat. Right? Um, it was very much the case with Yeltsin in, in, in Russia in, 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 in 1993. Um, it's been the case uh, in, in, in lots of places around the world where we believe that we put, if our guys win, then, then, then democracy is what's going to follow. We take a different approach to it than that. 
And what we think of is basically both the incumbent regime and the opposition are self-interested. What they want is to be in power. Right? Um, and whether they're in power under democracy or under authoritarianism, you know, in general, people would prefer to be an authoritarian ruler because then you get to do more of what you want, but there might be costs associated with that. Um, so under, other, some, under certain circumstances, it might be in your interest to democratize, have elections, and win them, right? And if you are pretty sure you can win these elections, um, or even better, if you can design the electoral system in such a way that you're pretty sure afterwards you can win these elections, then it, there's going to be lots of cases in which you have a pretty strong incentive to do this. Um, you have incentive, in, in, in other words, to, to build democratic institutions that favor your constituency. In that case, you're going to get uh, incumbent-led liberalizations. So the rest of the paper is a way of kind of thinking about when, it, when is it really that you're going to get these different kinds of, of circumstances uh, coming up. The key theoretical point here uh, also is to, to, keep, to bear in mind is um, that an incumbent-led liberalization then is going to look very different from one in which the incumbent authoritarians are kicked out. So the, the kinds of factors that you would expect to be associated with incumbent-led liberalizations are going to be different from the kinds of factors that, you'd be, that, you, would be, that you would expect to be associated with um, incumbents getting kicked out of office. In other words, your theory of liberalization is going to be different across these different kinds of liberalization. Let me sort of uh, open up this fantastic uh, can of worms, Pandora's box, uh, pile of something uh, <coughs> we call the dictator's de decision tree. This is a very schematic sort of uh, way of thinking about uh, the world that, that, we, that we use really just as a heuristic device for kind of setting up um, the idea of these different um, uh, liberalizations. Just, this room doesn't have a, a clock in it that I can see, so could you, would you mind letting me know if I, once I get to about half hour or so? I don't want to go on much longer than that. Um, so this is a you know, fabulously clear um, piece of uh, art um, that, that, that helps you to think through some of these decisions. So what we do is we depart from, there's a, there's a very famous uh, political scientist called Robert Dahl, um, whose work uh, is on d democracy and the nature of democracy and when democracy uh, uh, arises. And one of the many, many contributions of Dahl was to think about when authoritarian regimes are likely to, to open up and allow democratization. Um, and Dahl's argument, very, very simple, um, was that essentially he follows the same kind of logic that we're, that we're thinking al along uh, the lines of that essentially authoritarians are likely to liberalize when the costs of liberalizing, um, the costs of giving up uh, authoritarian rule are less than the costs of repressing. When it's more expensive to beat people in the streets, more costly to beat people up in the streets, you're going to allow them to, to have voice. When it's less costly to let the opposition compete with you, you're going to allow them to compete than, it, than when, it is, when it's more costly to allow them to compete. Um, it's a very, very simple argument, um, and it sort of allows you to start thinking about, obviously there's a million things that are packed into what makes it costly to repress and not costly to repress, what makes it costly to, to, to accept competition and not costly to accept competition. Um, but it sets up this kind of thinking about, about how, to, how, to, how an authoritarian dictator is going to look at the world. The first set of choices that your dictator has is whether to hold elections or not at all. So how seriously to take the idea that legitimacy requires some form of electoral process? And legitimacy might be understood in terms of legitimacy in the, in the eyes of the international community. Uh, more importantly, I think uh, it's, usually, it's often very tied up with legitimacy in the eyes of your own population. One of the really big mistakes um, that, that Putin and Medvedev made last weekend um, was to make, was to break with the um, implicit bargain that they had with the Russian people that these elections were meaningful and that Russia was somehow a legitimate de democratic political system that was, was not like the Central Asians. Um, the way they conducted themselves last weekend made it very clear that, that that's not the case and it made it embarrassingly plain and impossible to, to, 
to make, make it much harder for people to pretend anymore that Russia is not like Turkmenistan. I'll talk, we can ask, if you're interested more about that, I, I can talk about it in, in question and answer. So there's the legitimacy issue. Some authoritarians, nevertheless, decide that they don't need the legitimacy of elections, so they have some other source. The most obvious case of this would be someone like the, 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 the King of Jordan or the, or the, the Saudi Arabian um, ruling uh, family where they don't have or haven't had uh, elections. Um, some uh, Libya was one of these cases. It needs to be moved out of that box and, and moved over to, to Jordan, and, and Saudi Arabia can be, can be written in there. Uh, no, this is what happens when you write a paper and it says, for six months, the world moves on. Um, six months is pretty alarming speed, because there's <laughs> about a year normally between these things getting accepted and actually being published, and so you can look like a right moron by the time it comes out. <laughs> it's always unfortunate. Um, so there's lots of dictators that don't have elections. Right? And some of them survive and some of them don't. Now, actually, as it turns out, um, that accounts for about half of the significant political changes. This non-electoral liberalizations account for about half of the major political openings in the post-Cold War era. In this paper, we don't discuss them, um, and so and we and there, so that'll be a, a separate chapter in the book. So in this paper, what we do is we wander down the, the right-hand side, and here what you have is dictators that decide to hold elections. Um, So you wander down the right-hand side and, and you hold elections, and um, if you win, one, one possible outcome of this election is that you can win uh, strong, as we say. You can win very comfortably. Right? This is the, the, the case of, of, of Russia in, in 07 and the case of Tanzania in 1995. In one case, the Russian case, the regime decided that's fine, we're happy with the way things are, and we're going to keep the things uh, as they are. But the Tanzanians, on the other hand, decided uh, that, okay, what we're going to learn from this strong victory is that we can compete electorally, and so we can create more space for the opposition and allow them to, 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 to participate more um, in politics uh, and become more, more, more democratic in, 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 in form and in substance. Um, one of the reasons the Tanzanians probably did this is that Tanzania is very uh, aid-dependent, and Russia is not very aid-dependent at all. Right? So that, that may be one of the factors. That's one of the factors we'll look at later. Um, another thing that can happen is that you can win weakly. Right? You can win the elections, not get, over, not get defeated, but on the other hand, uh, surprise yourself at how badly you do. Right? This presents you with a choice. You can do uh, what uh, um, the revolutionary uh, leader uh, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe in, in, in 2008 did and, and, and use this electoral bad news, if you like, uh, as an excuse to clamp down on the opposition. Um, or you can do what the leadership in Comoros did in, 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 in 2002, and I couldn't tell you who the leader in Comoros was in 2002. Um, uh, but what happened there was essentially they, they, they won the election, but the turnout was really low. Um, and they decided that this really meant that the writing was on the wall, and what we have to do is move towards a more liberal political system. So there are two different ways in which you can get an elite-led liberalization coming out of these, these electoral, electoral uh, scenarios. Another scenario is that you might lose these elections. Right? You might hold the elections and then, and then, and then uh, probably to your surprise and certainly to your chagrin, you, you find yourself defeated. Um, then you also have a choice. You can uh, go the, the, the Mechiar way or the, the, the way that the communists in, in, in Romania did in 1996, Iliescu, and you can, you can, you can accept defeat and leave power. Um, and under certain circumstances, that might be your, your best option. Um, or you can do what the Algerians did in 1991 and, and say, you know, and just cancel the elections. This, is also, uh, this also happened in Burma. Um, the opposition wins, you cancel the election, and you declare some kind of military rule. Um, you can decide, okay, canceling the elections is too, is, 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 is too costly. Um, why don't we just cheat instead? Um, and cheating is, you know, carries its own risk. You can be like the Mexicans in 1988 and cheat and, you know, oh, the computer's broken. Oh, we'll 
come back in 10, 10 hours with, fun, fi with fixed computers and different results uh, and magically win the election. This is what happened in the, the Mexican presidential elections in, in 88. Um, or you can cheat and then no one buys it and you, and you, and you, and you fail. This is the, the Orange Revolution in, in, in Ukraine in 2004. It's, it's, it's Serbia 2000. So you see how this um, very simple sort of idea that, that dictators have, have agency, that they might have different sets of preferences um, depending on the circumstance, that their preferences are derived not from some primary view about democracy versus authoritarianism, but by the circumstances of, 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 that they find themselves in, can actually generate a whole different uh, number of um, outcomes that are related to whether or not you see political liberalization or not, and what kinds of political and any, any questions on that at this, at this point? All right. So in the next section of the paper, what we try and do is think about, okay, what are the predictable um, phenomena that we ought to observe related to these different kinds of outcome? What kinds of things are going to be associated with incumbent-led liberalizations, electoral turnover, electoral revolutions? Um, and how are they going to be different from one another? Right? If it's plausible that there are these different kinds of outcomes, how might, might we explain some of them? Um, and we're kind of at an early stage in this process. Um, those of you that read the paper will see there's, like, there's, there's sort of, in a sense, a sort of laundry list of lots of different things, um, which is partly uh, a result of the fact that there are lots of different things um, that can influence these, these, these outcomes. Um, but so far, we've sort of focused on three different things that we think really ought to um, cheat, that, ought, that, that ought to affect these different kinds of outcomes differently. And uh, heretofore, in the, in the academic literature, up to this point in the academic literature, people have tended to treat as being unicausal, as always looking the same and always having the same relationship with liberalization. Um, and so these are the cases in which, which, which things um, Ought to, ought to look a little bit different. One is about election types. So if you read um, the literature on democratization, um, the, those of you that are in my seminar will later on in the semester see this, most people associate political liberalization with better quality elections. Right? So the better the quality of elections that, 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 that take place in an authoritarian regime, and there's a range of different things you can do from completely faking the election and not um, not allowing anyone else to run in the election at all, through allowing other people to run but beating them up and, 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 and killing their supporters, um, through to um, allowing everyone to run but controlling the TV. There's a whole gamut of kind of electoral quality uh, issues that uh, ranges that you can do. People have always assumed that the better the quality of the election, the more likely it is that you're going to get political liberalization uh, turnover. And we argue that that's not really right. Uh, or at least it's not straightforwardly right. It's true if you're looking to see the incumbents get booted out of office. On the other hand, if you're looking to see incumbent-led liberalization, what you're probably going to see is a fairly controlled, um, poor quality election, followed by an incumbent victory, and then a liberalization afterwards. Once they've convinced themselves that they can um, control elections and, and, and win, then they're more likely to be open to, to, to liberalization afterwards. <coughs> In other words, poor quality elections can also cause liberalization. Um, second thing we thought of as well, you know, normally people think of uh, bad economic performance as being something that does in dictators. Right? So during, for example, the, 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 the crisis uh, in, in 2009, um, there was enormous excitement amongst the Russian opposition because this meant surely this, that, you know, that, that, that the Putin regime was based upon high economic growth and high oil prices economic crisis is going to reduce that, this is going to cause chaos, similarly in China. Right? What we argue theoretically is, well, you, you might see that with, with uh, replacements, with, with electoral turnover and revolutions, although I'm not 100% sure that, that, that you'll see that for reasons that we'll talk about later. Um, but you certainly are not likely to see that with incumbent-led liberalizations. Incumbent-led liberalizations, by contrast, ought to be associated with good economic performance. Dictators who think that they're going to do well in elections. I've done a good job in power, you know. Um, so, so if I put myself up for election, um, I'm likely to do to do pretty well. 
Um, and so incumbent-led liberalization is particularly ought to be associated with good economic performance. Um, and then finally, uh, there's the international context. Now, everyone has argued uh, that countries that are in, in more democratic neighborhoods are more likely to, to be um, are more likely to democratize, essentially, for a whole host of different kinds of reasons. Um, and we think that's probably right, and it's probably right for electoral revolutions, and it's probably right for turnovers, but it's probably not so right for incumbent-led liberalizations. Because one of the fears that you're going to have as an, as an incumbent authoritarian leader is that, you know, I, I'm all about democracy and all about winning elections, but I'm really not all about losing elections. Um, and so I want to kind of liberalize, but not necessarily democratize, right? Not necessarily go the whole hog. So what you're likely to see is lots of cases in which incumbent-led liberalizations are happen in places where the, the, the incumbents also feel that they can control, they can insulate their countries to a certain degree from outside influences. So if they're in a, in a very democratic rebel, uh, context, if, to give it a very concrete example, if you're uh, Lukashenko in Belarus, surrounded by much more democratic places, you really have to keep a tight lid on this thing, otherwise you're going to get kicked out of office. Um, he's not going to be someone who's likely to, 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 to move in a, in, a, in a liberalizing direction, knowing that if he does, his days are going to be numbered. Right? There's just too many other forces around to make, to, to make it sustainable. Those are the, 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 the basic uh, hypotheses that we, that we came up with. Um, all right, so you have a theory and you have some idea about what it's going to look like. Um, you have to come up with some way of testing it, and this is where the uh, where in political science there's always the, the fun in the games, uh, uh, or the not very fun, <laughs> and games start. Um, one of the things you have to do is 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 start to work out. Okay, I've gone on and on and on about political liberalization. Um, what do I actually mean by political liberalization, and how am I going to know it when I see it? Right. Um, so what we did was we essentially took. Um, a sort of theoretical approach and, a, uh, and an empirical approach. The theoretical approach is to understand that by liberalization, we don't mean democratization. Right? What we mean is some kind of form of political breakthrough, some, some improvement in the political conditions, a marked, substantial, uh, important improvement, but nonetheless, it doesn't have to be all the way towards democratization. Right? So Egypt has experienced a liberalization in this year if they get to somewhere where they have sort of somewhat messy Iraq-style elections, but they're really competitive, right? You, they don't have to become Sweden in order to, to, for this to be important, right? or Finland. Uh, um, if they became, you know, if it became Russia, that's already something, but you know, somewhere uh, like, like um, where there's really marked progress. Um, and so what we did was we took all of the indicators that people, ha that, that people use um, to measure democracy in the world, primarily uh, Freedom House and, and, and Polity, and we looked around for big improvements. And we looked around for big improvements that happened over a relatively short space of time, either, either within one year or within, within two years. And what we did was we found there was 92 cases of rapid liberalization uh, in countries with a population of more than 500,000 excluded uh, really small places in the period between 1992 and 2007. And then what we did was we took those 92 cases, um, ranked them alphabetically. Um, Popelikesh took, took, took A through Kyrgyzstan, uh, and I took everything from Kyrgyzstan to Zimbabwe. Uh, and we read up in the cases, looked into them. And what we did was we then coded them to see whether or not what had happened in these liberalizations was non-electoral, but it was really just a, it was kind of a revolutionary type situation. Whether elections were involved, but not really kind of in a, in a causal way, um, so we called those non-electoral. And then if elections were actually important, did these elections lead to incumbent-led liberalization? Did they lead to electoral turnover, or did they lead to, to some kind of electoral revolution? Um, the other thing that we did to see uh, whether our story about different kinds of elections was, was accurate, was we coded the quality of elections around the world since 1992. 
there's a number of people who've done some bits of the work for that, and we did, and we did a bunch of it ourselves. But essentially, what we did was we tried to work out a kind of four um, category coding scheme for, for elections in the, in the world since, since 92. Cases where there are no election at all, that's, that, or years where there's no election at all, that's pretty straightforward. Completely sham elections, um, so elections that really have no content, uh, no meaningful competition, where the opposition is maybe not allowed to run, uh, or where uh, there's no kind of effort to allow any kind of competition at all. Um, communist elections, the elections in Laos, for example, are a really good case. Laos has elections every four years regular as clockwork. The Communist Party wins 100% of the votes all the time. That's, that's, a, that's an election, but it's a sham. Then there are kind of seriously flawed elections, elections in which we think that you know, either uh, there was such sharp restrictions on the opposition that they really had no chance, um, the Russian elections and parliamentary elections are in, in 2007 um, come to mind. Um, elections that are, that are flawed, but only somewhat flawed, in which the opposition had at least a decent chance of winning, but for international observers reported there was lots of violations. Um, these are not dependent on who actually wins the election, right? but it's, it's whether or not ex ante observers or, or ex post while observers think that these elections had any meaningful real kind of um, possibility of, 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 of turnover, and then elections which are considered to be free and fair, elections which are which are basically very high quality. Um, and so the first test is to basically just take our 92 cases, um, divide them up according to non-electoral incumbent-led electoral turnover and electoral revolution, uh, and then classify them by the different kinds of uh, of of, of, of uh, regimes, uh, different kinds of elections. Sorry. Um, this is, you know, in the paper we go into all these very complicated independent uh, instrumental variables, regressions, and all sorts of tests for endogeneity and blah, 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 blah. But as a, as a rule, when you're doing empirical work, when you're doing statistical work, if it doesn't work in a very simple bivariate, okay, let me write down the cases and see if the line slopes the right way or if it kind of basically looks all right, then I wouldn't even bother with all of the more complicated stuff to show that it's, that it's really true. Um, this is always a really important first step for those of you that are actually doing research. Um, and what we find, fortunately, uh, is that, you know, kind of prima facie, the bivariate results anyway look pretty much like, like, we, like we had hoped they would. Um, what we find is that uh, non-electoral events are, are just, uh, just under half of all of the political liberalizations that take place. So there's lots of revolutions, there's lots of coups. Um, there's lots of, uh, uh, well, there are some authoritarians who, who up and die in office, um, which is always a good way of, of getting regime change. Um, uh, and that really accounts for, for about half of what's going on. So the political science literature anyway, which has been primarily about elections and the role of elections, uh, is only looking at about half the, the, country, the, half of the cases that, that they should be looking at. So that's already something that's, that's sort of an interesting finding. Um, Moreover, the other half that they are looking at, only about half of those, again, 24 out of, out of uh, 49, are uh, electorally led in the way that people have been assuming that they are, that somehow they, that the incumbent either uh, loses and gives up office or, 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 or cheats and gets caught and gets kicked out. A very large percentage of these cases, half of them are cases in which there's incumbents have, a, have, a, have an election and then, then they control the liberalization process themselves. Right? So this idea of incumbent-led liberalization empirically is actually really pretty important. Um, we also find that um, in terms of the sort of overall argument about what kinds of elections you should have that are going to matter, we find that there is some evidence at least, sham elections very rarely lead to anything, right? Um, sham elections, you kind of might as well not, not, not really have. On one occasion, they, they, they lead to, 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 to overthrows, but they're really not a lot important in this story. Um, very seriously flawed elections look like they matter for incumbent-led liberalizations. Um, unsurprisingly, they don't look like they matter for, uh, for an electoral turnover. If it's seriously flawed, they're, they're, you know, almost, almost by definition, the incumbents are not going to lose. Um, and they also seem to matter for, for electoral revolutions. And again, that you would sort of expect that in the sense that uh, 
you know, for there to be a post-election protest, there's going to be major flaws with the election. Um, uh, well, you might expect somewhat flawed elections to be to be to be more important. Right? So that's the basic sort of finding about elections. Um, we then move from this bivariate setup to a multivariate setup to regression analysis, where you look at okay. That's, that's elections, let's control for a bunch of other stuff and see if these election results still work, see if some of the other things that we talked about, international context, um, economic conditions, how does that pan out, and how does it stack up with other things that people have argued are likely to, 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 to matter. Um, in doing these regressions, these are something called independent variable regression, in, in, instrumental variable regressions um, that we use because um, of a problem of, 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 of what's known as an endogeneity problem. Um, any of you interested in statistics? Sort of, kind of. Um, all right, I, I won't. I won't. Uh, I won't bother you with all of that stuff. Um, essentially, what it means is you have to find. Um, the argument is that endogeneity means that the things that cause you to have, for example, a relatively free and fair election, are also likely to be things that cause you to have. Uh, electoral turnover, and so it's very difficult to argue um, that free and fair elections can have any effect here, right? So what you have to do is you have to find something that's associated with free and fair elections, but not associated with electoral turnover. Um, and instead of using free and fair elections, you you you, you take that out and you put this other thing in, right? and then you you, you calculate um, sort of stand-in variables. It turns out that's actually really easy for uh, holding elections. It's a little harder for, for the quality of elections, but it, 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 it's, it's possible. Um, if you do all of that, um, then what we find is, uh, lo and behold, we are correct still. Um, or at least kind of correct, uh, which, is, which is good. Um, we find that uh, the biggest influence on elections, let's take these, these columns, the plus signs, uh, if it's a plus sign, it means it has a positive effect. If it's two plus signs, it means it has a positive and really quite large uh, effect. The stars refer to whether it's statistically significant, right? So one star uh, here means it's significant at 0 0.05. Two stars means it's significant at 0 0.01. So very, it's a pretty high, pretty high reliability of the result. Right? Um, so just looking at the elections, what we find is that in the incumbent-led liberalizations, Seriously flawed elections play a pretty big role. Um, sham elections, to a certain extent, might play a role as well. Um, and, and somewhat flawed elections can play a role too. Um, so you get this, this sort of uh, bad elections have a big effect finding, which is what we had, had hoped that we would find. <coughs> With turnover, you get the classic story. You get the better the election, the, the more likely the outcome. And similar with electoral revolutions. Except for this one kind of slightly strange result here, which is the free and fair elections are not associated with turnover. That's probably an artifact of the, of the endogeneity problem that I talked about. But it's just as an empirical matter, very difficult to demonstrate that there's a relationship in here because of the closeness of the, 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 the causes of electoral turnover and free and fair elections. So that's probably a, a statistical artifact. But you do find that, that, that elections play a different kind of role across these different kinds of liberalizations, which is, the, which is really the, 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 the key issue. Um, I'm going to talk about the economics in a, in a minute. Um, we also find that uh, another sort of interesting finding is that um, if you control for the level of pre-existing democracy in a, in a country, dem democracy the year before liberalization, you get a really strong effect that, that incumbent-led liberalizations are much more likely to happen in more authoritarian places. Right? So incumbents are more likely to open up themselves if they've already lived, living in a, in a, or running a country that, that they have a very tight grip on, and they'll open up somewhat. Once you get to more democratic countries, incumbents are much more wary about, or much more, to more liberal countries, they're much more wary about further liberalization because you can liberalize to a certain extent and be confident of winning. Once you go too far, then you might start to be afraid you might actually lose. Right? Um, to use my favorite case, again, you know, the, the Russian government wants to have elections. They want them to be competitive. They want it to look okay, but they don't want to 
to lose, so they're always going to have a certain kind of reluctance to go beyond a certain point. On the other hand, they have strong incentives not to uh, cancel the elections, for example. Um, looking at the relationship between economics, our second uh, idea, remember we argued that we thought that what we, you would see is that uh, Incumbent-led liberalizations are going to be associated primarily with, with strong economic performance. Um, and the other two, you know, probably with bad economic performance, turnover is a little bit tricky in the sense that if you are um, been doing well and you lose the election, one of the things that you might do is think, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give up now because I can come back, right? And if I'm associated with having been in charge in good economic times, Economic cycles being what they are, the economic times are not going to be good forever, and then maybe I'll be in a position to come back. Right? So there may be an, it might, it's, it's not clear what the effect would be here. But we figure that uh, good economic times are not likely to be particularly conducive to electoral revolution. So one of the, the reasons that the, the, the Russians uh, don't have the electoral revolution in, 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 in 08, whereas the Ukrainians do in 04, is that Ukraine is doing economically much worse in 04 than, 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 than Russia is in 08. What we find empirically is sort of interesting. These are called, these are in table two in the paper for those of you that, that, that read it. These are, we interact uh, the level of inflation in this case with whether or not there's an election. And what we find is that if you hold an election uh, when inflation is low, in other words, when the economic situation is good, that's pretty strongly associated with there being the possibility of, of, an, elite, of an incumbent led liberalization. Um, it's also pretty strongly associated with there being electoral turnover for the reason that I just mentioned. But it's only very weakly associated with, or weakly asso associated with the electoral revolutions. Overall, what's interesting about this though, I think anyway, is not really to do with our theory, but more to do with a more general point, um, which is that often people think about bad economic times as being bad for dictators. And what we find empirically is that at least since the end of the Cold War, you're more likely to see liberalization in better economic times than in bad economic times. Um, now we can think of lots of different reasons why that might be, um, that we don't really test in any of this stuff, but it's, it certainly goes against the kind of standard uh, interpretation, or at least the, the newspaper interpretation of, of what we expect to see going on. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the, the regional democracy results too. Remember what we thought we were going to find was that if you had elections in a non-democratic region, um, you shouldn't, well, essentially the story was if the elections in democratic regions are not likely to lead to, to, to liberalization, but they are more likely to lead to turnover or revolutions. We found that very strongly in the revolutions case. It turns out this electoral revolutions phenomenon is really very much associated with the authoritarians who have elections in, in democratic regions. Uh, in part due to spillover effects, demonstration effects, in part due to very significant effects of people training activists in different countries. There's whole kind of schools of, in Estonia, they have a summer school um, uh, for, for training activists um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, is it Comoros? Or, 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 or I think it's Comoros. Um, the activists from Serbia who organized the, the, the revolution there in 2000 have set, were given an island by the government of Comoros where they could set up an institute and, and train activists all around the world. Um, the Euro European Union the United States fund these kinds of schools and so there's a, there's a lot of spillover effects. And that's what we, we find some evidence of that. We don't find any evidence that uh, you likely get much association between between uh, incumbent-led liberalization, though, in these uh, democratic regions, that really incumbent-led liberalizations really are different, um, and dictators are not likely to, to take the risk um, of, of opening up if they, if, they, if they don't really have to. Um, how long have we been talking? 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's plenty. Let me conclude. <laughs> um, what we found anyway is that not all political liberalizations are alike. Right? There's lots of different ways in the post-Cold War era of opening up politically, becoming more democratic. Not all political liberalizations by elections are alike. Right? So even if you have, even if elections play a role in the process somewhere, which they often do, um, that role varies from place to place. And that liberalization can result as much from incumbent confidence and opposition weakness, 
as it can from incumbent weakness and opposition strength, which is really quite different from the way people have tended to think about this up, up to now. Let me stop there and take any questions that you might have about, about this or about Russia or about <laughs> soccer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that uh, in some areas they, you know, uh, the dictators or authoritarian powers will control TV uh, or media sources. Uh, do you see the internet being a uh, counter, counter force that is uncontrollable by authoritarians, or how do you see it being to that? You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't see any reason X anti why that would be the case. Let me let me tell you why I think that it's not so obvious. Um, so the argument is that kind of social media sites and 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 and, and uh, the internet makes it easier for people to communicate with each other. Right? So it makes it easier for them to get together and, and organize things. Um, sure, that's true. Um, First thing about that is that, that that's not really all that new in the sense that ever since we've had SMS, people have been able to do that. So this is kind of been going on a while. If you look at part of my I wrote a book recently on, on protest and politics of protest in, in, in Russia. And what you find in the, in the 90s is that the National Bolshevik Party and all the kind of uh, opposition groups organized these flash mob events and it's all by SMS, right? This is before Twitter, before Facebook. Um, none of these people have internet access, right? So you don't, in a sense, you don't, need, you don't even need internet access to have this cap capacity. Although it may help, it might make it easier. <laughs> it might change the cards from a little bit. But the other reason why I think it's not necessarily going to always have that huge effect is that governments have access to the internet too. And so, for example, the Iranian government, what they did in in in, in, in 09 was they used um, Facebook uh, as a way of identifying oppositionists and going around and arresting them and, and heading off events. Right? Um, and you know they have a lot of, have a lot of resources to throw at it. So I think it sort of changes. It makes it, it makes participation cheaper for sure, but it might also make repression cheaper. Um, and the balance of those two things I think is not always entirely obvious. So when you do see a revolt, you're go you're likely to see you know, social media playing a role, but you're also likely to see social media playing a role in lots of cases where you don't see any kind of successful revolt or, or where you see no revolt or successful at all. And the case, I mean, if, if, if social media really have this enormous effect, then the one place on earth where you would expect to see a revolution this year is Russia. Um, they're the most, um, one of the highest levels of internet penetration, very, very highly educated population. Um, very, very high levels of usage of blogs and, 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 and social media. There's there, they have a whole set of things um, that they use there that, that are very widely used amongst activists and others. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'd be surprised. Uh, um, not totally surprised, but, but, you know, I think, so I think, it, I think it's, this is a very, it's easy to get super excited about it, and it is exciting, um, but I also think, you know, some people in the in the in the in the, the, the FSB in Moscow, they're also excited about the internet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we should bear that in mind. Yeah. In regards to Russia and like the four types of election between sham, heavily flawed, somewhat flawed, and fair, it seems like everybody outside observers outside Russia saw like the 2007 elections as is pretty heavily flawed. But you mentioned that over the last week, there's been a change within uh, how the population sees. The government. How did it, like? How did they see elections beforehand? Did they see them as as just somewhat flawed or somewhat fair, or did they just not care that much? And is it and yeah. is it kind of shifted to where they see the There's shame? A lot of variations. It's going to be really, really interesting to see how. So it, what I would have loved to have done would have had surveys in the field, you know, last Thursday, and then mm -hmm. another one on Tuesday, um, and see if what the difference was. Um, and you know, there, there are kind of surveys that should allow us to, to, to watch that. Well, people have generally uh, thought, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of variation. Some people think the whole thing's a sham. Some people think it's totally democratic. Most people think it's kind of kind of fixed, but they don't really care. Um, you know, some people think it's kind of, you know, it's, it's 
fixed but okay and then you know acceptable and so there's a there's a there's a range. Um, I I don't think anyone's really detected much you know really significant changes in those levels, those relative sizes of those groups over the last uh, decade or so. Um, you know, the reason that Putin has been so successful in winning elections is that Putin is incredibly popular. Now the question is, is he incredibly popular because you know he muzzles opposition and fixes the media? Um, well, partly, right? Um, but he's also popular because you know, compared to what was before, it, things have got for the vast majority of people tremendously better. Um, and it's hard to tease out which is which is the stronger effect, right? Because we haven't we haven't seen a Russia with a free media under Putin, um, or at least with free 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 t television. Um, but it's really what so what people say in the kind of chattering classes in Moscow um, is that. Um, Beforehand, they could at least tell themselves they could go to bed at night and think that they that they that they that they don't live in, in a Central Asian autocracy. Um, they're kind of they're kind of racist for the most part, and they have this idea of, of you know, being European as, as opposed to being Central Asian. Um, and what happened last weekend has really kind of made that harder to pretend to themselves. Um, and that might be a lot of people saying that's a really really big mistake. Because what Putin did was was really, really, really stupid. I, I read a comment from a guy in Moscow the other day who said, you know, the speeches they made last weekend, I don't know how many of you follow Russia as much of a nerd-like fashion as I do, but <laughs> essentially last Friday and Saturday, Putin and Medvedev made speeches in which they said, um, okay, we're going to switch jobs. I'm gonna, Putin's going to run for the presidency. Medvedev will be his prime minister. And we agreed to do this years ago. Right? Well, that's really really a dumb thing to say because for the last two years or more, Medvedev's been pretending that he's going to run. He's said it many, many, many times that he's actively considering running. And Putin has said the same. And if they agreed on it years ago, then that's not true. And if it is true that they were thinking about it, then they didn't agree on it years ago. So they've just said very openly, we lied. We're not, you don't know which lie we told you, but, <laughs> but we lied, right? And that makes it you know, it makes it, that's made it harder to swallow for a lot of people. And you actually saw some big resignations in the Russian government this week, which I think uh, had to be unanticipated. Uh, um, and a lot of dis dissatisfaction amongst the kind of Moscow elite. Um, there's a whole series of other things that have happened that, 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 that kind of uh, add to that too. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's going to be really, really interesting. I think. A lot of people have said in the last few days, oh gosh, you know, Russian politics is boring, you know, it's always the same, it's always Putin. I don't really see it that way at all. I think this is a very, very tense and difficult moment for them. One of the things that I documented in the book is that civil society and opposition groups in Russia are much more active and much more organized than people think. Uh, I'm in the middle of a, of, a, of a project at the moment where we're gathering data on protest events um, in different parts of Russia, and, and, you know, at least according to the stuff that we've collected, there are, you know, several thousand protest events every year taking place in different parts of Russia, often with participation up to you know, a few hundred to, to, to a few thousand. That kind of thing can get out of hand really, really quickly uh, if, if you're on, if, if, and, and under the right circumstances. So I actually think this is kind of a, an interesting and dicey period as a, a, for a number of reasons. And if we get to March, get to the presidential elections, and nothing really, you know, particularly interesting happens. That in itself will be extremely interesting because I think this is a very, very tricky moment for them to to to, to, to navigate. Um, yeah, I have two uh, related questions. First, <clears throat> can democracies grounded on the principles of constitutionalism, personal freedom, and limited government exist in a world devoid of authoritarianism, or are authoritarians vital necessities to both the production and the maintenance of liberal democracies? I always get nervous when people read their questions and it implies that they thought about it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really, really interesting question. So you're basically asking if do democracies need authoritarians? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. So one of the things that... Um, here's, a, here's a sort of sociology of knowledge answer to that question, right? Um, when you become a political scientist, you get into it, people get into it for all sorts of weird reasons, but um, I got into it because I was really interested in, 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 in I originally was very interested in, in, 
the Soviet Union and, and how that system worked. And then that fell apart in the middle of my final exams, which was kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> uh, and so we've been very interested in this big experiment that's taking place afterwards. And so there's a lot going on there. And so what you tend to do with that is you say, you, know, you read all this literature on democracy, authoritarianism, or whatever, and you think, OK, what I'm interested in is, is authoritarianism. I'm, not, I'm going to accept that there's something called democracy that's you know, better, that's more participatory, that's kind of more free in terms of citizen input and all of that. And I'm going to study these other places. And then people who decide that they're interested in democracies kind of dig deep into democracy and they try and see you know, what the strengths and weaknesses are and, and, and you know, do, is, is the US really a democracy? Comparatives tend to just kind of black box that for, for, for a while. I think that's actually intellectually a very weak distinction and it's certainly you know, it, it's not defensible it's not a defensible thing to do in that intellectually um, and there really is a lot of commonality between some of the things that happen in democracies and some of the things that happen in, in non-democracies and democracies are what we call democracies very enormously from one to the other I mean Sweden is really a very different place from from the United States um, from Mexico which we now call a democracy um, and certainly as a as a rhetorical exercise to get back to the legitimacy story that I started at the beginning with. This story that you know, we were elected according to the Constitution and according to these procedures that involve uh, participation and consultation of the masses is incredibly powerful. But would become probably less powerful if everybody could make similar kind of claim to that. And so we would look much more carefully at, okay, so you follow the Constitution, big deal. You know, what happens when you're actually in office how does that all work? What's the what's what's the dynamics of that? Um, uh, so I think I think probably in a sense like I don't know the answer to that, but my guess would be if this legitimacy story that that, that I told you is correct, um, then then it would be it would certainly change things a lot for dem for democracies. That's a great question. In your paper, you talked about the strength of like incumbent regimes. How do you like what parameters do you use to decide like what's a strength and what's a weakness and how strong and how weak they are? Yeah, well, so this is really difficult to do, um, and uh, we for a long time had in this paper. You know, so I had that 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 branch in the tree where you can either be Tanzania and liberalized, or you can be Comoros and liberalized. So you can be an incumbent who's strong and liberalizes and an incumbent who's weak and liberalizes. Um, and we couldn't come up with a really good way of telling what was a strong incumbent and what was a weak incumbent in a way that was systematic. I mean, you kind of see the extremes. So a strong incumbent who runs a relatively, you know, somewhat flawed election and wins 80% is clearly stronger than one who wins, makes 50%. But it's very hard to sort of dichotomize that. Um, and what we also thought was really, well, what you're trying to do as an incumbent is feather your nest for the next round when it's more liberal. And that's going to be the same incentives whether you're weak or strong. And so that's why we settled upon this idea of incumbent-led liberalizations as opposed to strong and weak incumbent-led liberalizations. Because it's just, I think, empirically difficult to, to, to do what you, as you, you know, quite rightly point out, and that's, that's hard to see. Um, much easier is to identify cases that that are, that are very authoritarian and cases that are less authoritarian. So you basically you know look at the degree of political rights and the degree of civil rights. There's a lot of kind of reasonably accepted international scales for those. You take a bunch of different ones and you you you, you know you use them simultaneously, and then you can kind of uh, work that out. That's that's a, a, a sort of theoretically and empirically a solvable question. The strength question is much much harder. What some people do. Um, in political sciences, they say, well, um, there are going to be some factors that systematically affect incumbent strength. The most marked one being, uh, uh, well, the two really that they use. One is the size of the coercive apparatus. Um, you know, how many men do they have in armed formations um, that they could use if, ne if necessary? We control for that. We actually never find that that really matters all that much, but that's probably because it's a, we don't have really good measures of that. Um, the other way to do it is to say, well, you know, what kind of, um, what kinds of incumbents systematically are likely to be strong, and what kinds are likely to be weak? And people have made the argument that um, incumbents who 
come from revolutionary parties who fought together in a revolution, took control of the state. Having done that, that, that creates a much stronger bond than uh, political parties that are formed in just kind of you know, ad hoc ways. So you would expect to see, for example, the Mexican um, uh, institutional revolutionary party being a long-lasting, strong regime, authoritarian regime, because of this revolutionary experience. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union, ditto. Uh, the Yugoslav Communist Party, these would all be strong, whereas something like United Russia, uh, or um, uh, I don't know, some of the, 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 the authoritarian, the, the military regimes in Latin America, for example, those would be weaker because they don't have that institutionalized revolutionary past. Um, I don't, no one has able, been able to test that effectively yet, although there are research projects looking at that right now um, that people are doing. Um, but so it's those kinds of ways that, that people think about it. But that's a really tricky, tricky issue. You had a, a question. Me? Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, curious about uh, the government in Russia, their their role in, in protest, because I know it's difficult in Russia to organize protests just because you have to, there's a government apparatus that you have to go through. So I'm just curious how that sort of affects their, not legitimacy, just effectiveness. So there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of different things than that. Um, uh, they are uh, a number of things to say about that. One is that they've that they've they've really worked hard to develop a system where they get to control who gets to protest and who doesn't, right? while at the same time uh, conforming with Article Thirty One of the Russian Constitution, which guarantees you the right um, to peaceful unarmed protest. So that's kind of where they start off. One of the things that they do is they have they have this uh, uh, system of uh, petitions of, of permissions that you're allowed to, that you're required to obtain, which incidentally, if you want to organize a protest on Franklin Street, you also need permission uh, to do or, or anywhere else. So anytime you want to get a lot of people gathered together, you need police permission everywhere. Question is how easy or hard to make it. Right? Um, and what they do is they say, they, they introduce the rule, a law that says, you know, any group of uh, five people um, or, or more who are standing uh, less than five meters apart that constitutes a, 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 a demonstration and so you need a, you need a, a, a certificate for that. Um, they also uh, uh, do a number of other things like they, they, you know, they, they, when there is a big symbolic date coming up or, or you know, there's, a, there's a, a protest event organized so, so for example around the G8 when, when when St. Petersburg was the, was the host city for the G8 summit, which was in 2008, um, they went around arresting troublemakers beforehand so that the troublemakers couldn't co come to St. Petersburg and cause trouble. And they had very, very tight police cordons around the city and went through the trains as people arrived and, and picked out, looked for IDs and picked out people from lists like, um, to, in order to kind of control this, this thing. Um, then they, they organized, they, they created a space for people to protest um, on an island, <laughs> uh, far, far, far away from where the conference was, uh, and they shut the bridge from the island to the city and you know, things like that. Um, so they've, they've worked pretty, pretty hard to do that. Um, they've also uh, done a number of things that are um, even sort of more innovative in, 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 in my view, which is they Okay, so it's quite easy, it's relatively easy to limit the degree to which people are protesting against you. Um, but it's even better to have a lot of people pro demonstrating in support of you as well. Right? So they've gone to really substantial lengths to um, create um, what I call in the, is, is I write about this a lot in, the, in, in my book, I call it, it, or is that social movements, which are kind of like fake social movements. So they're not really fake because people actually do want to join them. So you set up an organization um, the most famous example is this organization called NASHI, which means ours, and it's kind of a youth movement, and it's a pro-Putin uh, youth organization. Um, they came upon this, this is actually hard to do because it's difficult to get people enthusiastic. You, know, you can get people to show up for one demonstration by paying them money, and they, they did that in the early 2000s. But it's difficult to get them to be enthusiastic, it's difficult to get them to show up for more than one, and so they've developed this really elaborate set of uh, institutions around which um, 
they have summer camps, they have uh, scholarships, uh, the, the, you, you get meetings with uh, uh, business executives and other people who are going to be able to help you in your career. Um, they've also gone a tremendous lens to kind of cultivate this image of, um, I, I sort of think of it as chic authoritarianism. Um, there's kind of like a um, sort of sexy authoritarianism that they're trying to cultivate where they um, you know, Putin wears leather jackets a lot, and, and, you know, <laughs> strips down to the waist a lot, and um, the pro Putin movement sell bikinis and underwear and, and all these kinds of things with his face on it. And so it's kind of like, it's an attempt to sort of make the authoritarian regime cool for young people. And, you know, and it works for some young people. You know. It also drives a whole bunch of other young people crazy, and they go off and they join, you know, really extremist political parties because uh, they're so kind of outraged and offended and, um, then then those people will then find really innovative ways to get around the rules um, and so one of the things that you see a lot of in, in St. Petersburg and, and in Moscow is you get these really weird protests now there's a bunch of guys called the Blue Bucket Brigade which go around and they just leave blue buckets everywhere and everyone knows that when you see blue buckets this is an opposition statement um, uh, it's really a, it's really a statement against uh, the the elite in in, in Russia have um, these these blue lights that they put on top of their cars. So the play, it's supposed to be limited to important officials, but it's pretty widespread amongst uh, the the elite. And you put this blue light on your car and then you just drive through traffic. And so these people are the, the reason for the blue buckets is kind of it's like it's like the blue light that you put and so you wear it on your head or you just kind of leave a a hundred blue buckets lying outside of the, the city council office or something like that. And everyone knows what you're talking about. Uh, they do uh, these non, non, what they call non-mass demonstrations where you get a, a thousand people and you all stand five meters apart. <laughs> um, and, and that therefore it's not a demonstration. Um, or you try and do that as, as to the extent possible. Um, there was a, <laughs> was a group uh, uh, in, in, in Moscow um, who uh, a group of, of, of women who go around kissing women police officers and videotaping it, um, uh, which is just a kind of you know gesture. Uh, um, there was a group in St. Petersburg who painted an enormous penis on, on, a, on one of the bridges. I any of you that know St. Petersburg has all these really big bridges that come up every night. Um, <laughs> Putin's hometown, and so they did that. It was. If a lot of people got arrested for that. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, people find, it's really, I, I just find it's really interesting. I mean, for that's mostly what I've been working on the last 10 years or so, and, and I'm still continuing to work on it. But it's, it's just that people are incredibly creative in finding their way around these administrative rules. Belarus is another really wonderful place. The New York Times even had, a, had an article recently about protest in Belarus, where it's a very dangerous place to protest. So people do things like they had these clapping protests where you would show up in the, in the main square in Minsk on in, in, in Wednesday night at 8 o'clock and just start applauding. Um, and, you know, it's really hard for the, you know, arrest me for applauding. I mean, are you kidding me, right? And so you have thousands of people standing in the square or sitting on a bench reading their newspaper or whatever, and then they put the paper down and everyone just starts clapping. Um, they, people got arrested for that, so they switched to cell phones, and everyone's cell phone went off at 8 o'clock on the following Wednesday. Um, these kinds of, of things that are, you're, you know, but my mom's calling. You know. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's really amazing what people, what people do. Yeah. Um, can you say something about the, um, uh, the recent uh, happenings in Ukraine with the previous prime minister being uh, accused of uh, misdealings? You with the Russian debt. Uh -huh. With the Russian oil, whatever. Yeah, you know this is this is the great joy of post-communist politics in the, in the former Soviet Union. Is you know, I mean, if you want to find some dirt on people at the top, there's loads of dirt on people at the top. Um, you know, there may be some honest politicians, but you know, I mean, maybe I haven't seen any. Um, in part because it's just not possible to to make it to the top of politics without. You know, with, or to make it to a business without breaking lots of laws, right? Um, so there's this long-standing, kind of for those of you that are not particularly into Ukraine, there's a long-standing kind of uh, fight between uh, the people who organized the Orange Revolution um, and uh, the, 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 the sort of supposedly Russia-supported candidate. 
Um, so these guys won the Orange Revolution in 2004, and then the next, uh, then they proceeded to fall out immediately. Um, uh, and the president um, Yushchenko fell out with the prime minister Timoshenko, who's this, who's this, uh, this uh, Ukrainian princess. Um, she wears her blonde hair in this old Ukrainian peasant style. Um, and uh, they, they rapidly fell out. Now, Timoshenko made her money in, the, in gas dealing. She made an enormous amount. They call her the gas princess. She made a tremendous amount of money in, in trading gas, uh, which all comes from Russia. So she clearly had really important connections uh, in, 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 in Moscow. Otherwise, there's just no way this would have happened. Um, so when the, uh, the, 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 the people who lost out in 2004 win in 2008, they're gunning for, 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 for her. Right? Um, whether it's, I mean, whether it's legitimate or not, it's, it's so far beyond that in my view that it's really hard to say and then who cares anyway, right? Because, um, you know, I, there, 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 this is one of these situations where I, I suspect there's almost no one except for a few kind of really uh, true believers who think that, 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 that Timoshenko is not guilty of something. Um, and, and almost no one who really thinks that this per that this prosecution over is because of things that she's actually done that she's guilty of, right? So, so it's so politicized that it's, it's, it's the, 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 the underlying reality is kind of irrelevant. In a sense. Do you think it has anything to do with uh, what's going on in Russia? In terms of. So Putin wants revenge, and then, yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, there's yeah. Still sort of a, you know, yeah, this is this is uh, one of these things that that, that a social scientist would say is overdetermined. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of reasons why you would expect to see this happening, and and, and yep, it's happening. You know? uh, there's plenty of domestic Ukrainian reasons uh, for why uh, uh, why why the government would want to would want to get her off the scene. She's really so. Um, uh, Yushchenko, who became president in 2004, really rapidly became kind of politically non-viable because he went to s such an extreme Ukrainian nationalist point that was seeking the from he's really from supporters of mostly from from the west of Ukraine, um, where the, whereas uh, Timoshenko was more from Kiev and, and she so she was a more more of a moderate in that sense, and so she represents a more serious political threat to the current president than, than, than the former president does, and so she's an obvious obvious target. And, you know, would, would Putin be, you know, upset if she went to jail? I mean, no, right? So, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that, he, that he, he set it up. I'm sure if called, he would have helped. Though. Yeah. Um. What is your opinion on the statement made by Larry Diamond that either a new regime type or a previously rejected one will emerge within this century as a viable alternative to liberal democracy? In other words, is he onto something or is this a load of hogwash? Uh, I need to know more about what he meant by that. Is yeah. it something instead of liberal democracy as being something taking the place as being yeah. the best form of government that we are aware of? Um, it would certainly, it would be great news, right? Because it would stop people uh, coming out with the old Churchill quote about democracy being, you know, terrible, but, but, but the best of all bad options kind of thing. We would at least get new cliches. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, I, it's, it's, so I, I'm sitting around with a colleague of mine the other day. Here's all I've got for you on this. Um, uh, he's a political theorist. And he studies democracy and the theory of democracy and all of that stuff. And he calls he calls me into his office and he says, you know, so the New York Times has this article about how young people aren't interested in democracy anymore and they don't vote and they're all protesting all over the world in India and Israel and Spain. Um, you study protest, you know, is this is this the wave of the future? What's 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 you know what's going on? And you know, after talking about it for half an hour, the conclusion was, who the hell knows? And Worse than who the hell knows, how on earth would you go about finding out, right? Um, what political scientists do is take questions that are interesting, hopefully, and try and work out how you would actually answer them. And there are some really interesting questions that you can answer, some really interesting questions that are really, it's difficult to do much about, and this sounds like one of those. Um, I mean, if you were to say, you know, the, the arguments, is, uh, 
some of you probably saw this this article. It certainly caused a lot of stir in my in my field. Um, uh, essentially, arguing that you know young people are not in, into institutions; they're into protests in the streets. But a like you know, welcome to uh, young people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's been the truth for for a bit, uh, at least. Um, B, you know, okay, so the Spanish youth are protesting on the streets because they can't get jobs. Well, their situation is pretty, you know, it's understandable that they would be. But I would also bet that if they come the next Spanish elections, if you were to just cancel them and not have them, uh, you would have much more problems on your hands than, than if you didn't. Right. Um, so it doesn't seem to me, you know, that there's, I mean, I, I can't think of, of a viable alternative that, that you know, you cancel the elections that would, and, I mean, there's always ways of making things better and, and you know, improving the quality of elections, the quality of consultation, these kinds of things. But a whole new rabbit out of the hat, so it doesn't, I don't know where it's coming from. All right. On the, uh, I have no idea at all whatsoever <laughs> notes. <laughs> well, that's all thank Professor Robertson. Thanks a lot. <laughs>